Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, first in a series of three, three webinars about um, providing remote access for users with FreePBX or PBExact. Uh, this first part is will be done, you know, there's sev several ways of doing this, uh, and we're providing solutions. So the first part will be based on session border controllers, how to do it using session border controllers. I'm uh, Frederick Dickey. I run uh, different things at Sangoma, including support, uh, marketing, and product management. And I have with me uh, Ernesto Casas. Ernesto, please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session. I hope we have a, we're going to have a good time. Great. Thank you. OK, so what we're going to talk about is um, you know, in this day and age with voice over IP, uh, PBXs, you know, a typical single location office would have a bunch of users that have their, you know, computer laptops, a bunch of IP phones that hang off the same LAN. Um, you know, the PBX would reside in a, um, in a, you know, a lot of times these days, an IP PBX is, is a pure software application that runs on a completely standard server, just like your, I don't know, CRM or file server or email server or web servers, right? So you would have like a cluster of servers in your office, <clears throat> you know, to connect your voice over IP network to the public network. Maybe you'd use a PSTN gateway to hook up to good old T1s and E1s and BRI lines or analog, whatever you have in your region. And you would have some sort of broadband connection to the internet. Uh, and, and a router slash firewall slash NAT device that protects, um, you know, unwanted traffic from the outside, right? So that's kind of a very typical office these days. Uh, you know, most PBXs out there are now voice over IP, so, uh, you know, deploying, deploying your PBX is pretty much like an application, just like another application on your uh, data network. And if we extend this, um, you know, multiple, you know, you don't have to be a big company to have multiple locations or have people working from home. Um, there's all kinds of solutions for remote offices, whether it's branches or home offices, to access, you know, you know, your email server, your, your CRM server or whatever. But for voice over IP, if you want them to leverage the PBX functionality to be able to sit you know, at their office and be uh, using dialing by extension uh, their colleagues in the main office, there's some challenges because that firewall, if we could uh, just go to the next slide, please. <coughs> because that firewall, that router that you use over the internet is meant to block traffic that originates from the outside. It's not very good. Uh, it's not a very good situation when you want to use voice over IP and you want people to be able to just call you, right? So, um, so that's what we're going to do in the next three sessions. So the first session is today. The next two are in January. But that's what we're going to do. Uh, next slide, please. Is um, provide you, you know, bunch of the, there's always a lot of questions and architecture questions and network diagrams and stuff. But what we're going to try and do in the next three sessions is to provide you different ways of getting these remote users on ramp or being able to access your main office voice over IP features while you know not not compromising without compromising your uh, your security and your network so talking about you know what do I do with my firewall ports do I open them up do I do port forward do I do DMZs you know uh, there's session border controllers that are often used for uh, adding some protection in voice of IP, and that's what we're going to cover today. Uh, there's people that implement VPNs. Uh, what do I need to do specifically for voice of IP? So we have three sessions. Uh, like I said, this session today will cover doing exactly this, but using an SVC. The next session will be around, well, maybe I'm getting into your slides, <laughs> uh, Ernesto. Why don't you uh, take us through that slide and uh, explain how we're going to lay out the various options here? Oh, of course, Frederick. Thank you. Uh, OK, so uh, we're going to have three sessions, starting the first one today. And uh, there's uh, three different approaches in order to provide secure access to remote users. 
when using an IPPVX and in this case specifically free PVX or PVX Act, right? So today we're gonna present how to do it when using an SVC in the equation uh, as one of the components of my architecture. Uh, on January 10th, we're gonna uh, show how to use, how to do it uh, implementing VPNs and taking advantage of all the VPN capabilities that are built in inside uh, PVX, PVX Act or Free PVX. And uh, the third ses session uh, is going to be dedicated to using enabling TLS and SRTP as a secure way to connect SIP communications between remote users and and the PBX using the built-in capabilities of TLS and SRTP uh, for free PBX and PBX Act. So, um, so let's move on. Uh, so session one, SBCs, uh, using SBC. How the SBC is going to help us on securing remote access to our uh, telephony infrastructure, okay? Uh, which are, what are the challenges that we, we're, we're going to face. And, uh, there are several challenges we're going to face. One of them is a uh, foreign and transversal, which means uh, solve all the, all the typical issues that happen when you have a user, a remote user that is behind uh, infrastructure that you don't control, you don't have any control. You don't control sometimes even the, the, the router that is provided by the, the, SIP, the, the internet provider in, in my employee home office, right? So how are we gonna solve that problem? Uh, additionally, uh, how are we gonna make sure that we have a secure and protected infrastructure? I mean, I, I, the, 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 the typical evolution is customer that discovers now that has an IPPVX, uh, there is uh, no limitations on where I can just put a, an endpoint. Then they, they open up the, the, the PVX to the internet to allow any user to connect. And that opens uh, a Pandora box. Okay, there's a lot of problems that start to happen. Uh, uh, one is uh, basically potential attacks to your infrastructure, and the other one is secure the content of your communications. I mean, you don't want to have a, a third parties tapping your communications and recording your conversations, right? It's like putting your wiring closet with the door opens in the middle of the street, right? So on top of that, another challenge is uh, the more we add uh, um, uh, responsibilities or, or functions inside my PBX to control all these type of situations, the more resources I'm taking out of the PBX to really provide uh, the, the, the services to the end users, I mean, the, the telephony service per se, the UC services per se. So those are the typical challenges that we're gonna face. Uh, the use case that we're gonna uh, present here on this uh, kind of a uh, workshop, uh, I have a live implementation here, so I'm gonna try to show you a little bit of what is happening in the reality. Is a is a is a use case that is shown on the on this slide. So we have a, on one side my main office or data center or or headquarters where I have the PBX behind an SVC. The SVC is gonna talk, connect, communicate with the PBX via. I'm using a blue arrow here, which means I'm gonna be using SIP and UDP traditional SIP connections. But once we get into the public network, all the communications between the SVC and any remote user, even if there is a soft phone in a, uh, for an employee or a remote office or a branch office, et cetera, everything is gonna be uh, protected or secure using TLS and SRTP. In this case, even we're gonna show on the third session TLS SRTP implemented inside the PBX. In this case, we are using TLS and SRTP implemented on the SVC. Okay, uh, the network layout of what we have implemented here is we have our SVC. Uh, it has, uh, I have two connections, one on the left side. Let me 
use the laser pointer. Okay. On the left side connection, this is a one interface that is going to be looking to the external side, and one interface on the right side that is looking on the internal network. This one is going to be uh, connecting uh, to the or facing the PBX, and the external one is going to be facing the users on the internet. Okay, uh, this could be implemented in several ways. Uh, one one of the typical implementation is that the SVC is just sitting in middle in between the uh, DMZ zone and the internal network. The internal network is on where the PBX is installed, and the DMZ zone is where not only the SVC but maybe some other servers you have installed for, you know, for example, uh, uh, web server or web applications, etc. So we have a public IP address, which is the IP address that is going to be published as the access point to the SVC and uh, in, in, in real terms for, for any IP phone outside this is the IP address that they're gonna uh, think the PBX is located. We are going also to use a, a domain uh, FQDN this domain address uh, this domain FQDN resolves this public IP address and this is the domain that is going to be used for any uh, registration and authentication. Um, Ernesto? Yes. Sorry, uh, uh, if you could go to the, the private previous slide, sorry. Sure. So in that case, the SBC, right, is you're using two physical Ethernet ports on that SBC, right? The one on the left and the one on the right, they're, they're physically separated, correct? That's correct, yes. So if somebody from the outside on the internet would hit that outside of the firewall IP address and get get to the DMZ, you know, I don't know, they're trying to do a, a SIP registration flood, it would hit the SBC first, not not the PDX, correct? That's correct, and you, and you can have the rules to detect that uh, pattern. Yes. Uh, uh, on the SVC, you need to uh, expose the PBX or, or okay. have the risk of being, you know, denial of service attacked on the PBX. So the SVC would fend this off and the, mm -hmm. the PBX wouldn't have yeah. to. There are several techniques that is going to use not only the traditional, uh, okay. the traditional stuff on Linux, but also we use a lot of uh, uh, databases of uh, patterns that we can detect. But in this okay. case, additionally, the other additional protection in this case, and that's one of the, the reasons of using TLS, is that there is no way to talk SIP, with a, to, to try to initiate any SIP interaction with the SPC uh, without having the right credentials to encrypt on the TLS tunnel. Got you. Okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, so from the SVC, we're, we're going to be using some of the functionalities of the SVC. One of them is what we call Open or Through Registrar. is the, the capability of the SVC to impersonate the PBX and be able to receive all the SIP requests and then forward those, those receive requests, including Registrar, and send it back to the PBX. Uh, the SVC is going to be doing additional uh, uh, things like transport conversion. It's going to be converting TLS uh, to SIP or SRTP for the audio traffic to RTP. And uh, it's a, it could be also doing a, a codec conversion, transcoding. Um, um, it will be also uh, managing all the SIP requests that are not related to a specific se call session, like uh, messages going back and forth between the phones and the PBX related to presence or message waiting indicator, etc. There are several different type of uh, um, transactions that are not, not related to a specific call. And also, uh, and that, that, that is going to be done in this lab with using additional uh, firewall functionalities on the SBC, but, the, but, but, but this can be done even on on the customer uh, firewall, which is uh, there are several additional ports that are needed for 
specific additional functionalities on the PBS, such as uh, provisioning the phones, uh, loading the phone apps, uh, configuration management, etc. Okay, so we can use the firewall capabilities inside the SBC, or we can use the port forwarding capabilities enabled on the on the corporate firewall. Well, in this case, we're going to use the SBC. So our final goal is, of course, make sure that voice service is going to work without any challenge. I forgot to mention that uh, one of the functionalities we're going to use on the SBC is a, is a, a remote NAT transversal. is to solve the problem of, uh, you know, fixing any any situation with a NAT transversal or any challenge in NAT transversal. Okay, of course we, we want we want this uh, to um, allow any, any, any voice service to operate uh, seamless, but also make sure that all the functionalities and the values, when you implement the PBX, it's not only to make phone calls between extensions, right, or make phone calls to the PSTN, etc. There are additional functionalities that makes the life easy for the user. And uh, in the case of free PBX and PBX Act, there is a lot of value in the, the capabilities that we provide to uh, make very easy the phone provisioning, uh, make very easy for the user to interact with the voice services using the phone apps and using some additional applications such as the user control panel, which is a web access to the telephony services, or using the Sulu client, which is a is a is a Windows or is a, is a client that you can install in the in the laptop or the PC of the user where he can have a call pop-ups or click to call uh, a WebRTC uh, client etc cetera, etc. Cetera. And at the end, simplify the PBX administration. So from from this point on, I'm I'm going to try to uh, summarize in a step by step what needs to be done on the PBX and also what needs to be done on the SVC in order for this to work. Uh, I know that for, for some of the attendees today, maybe you, you don't have the enough uh, knowledge or uh, uh, technical uh, inside knowledge of how the SVC works or how it is configured. Uh, and the same thing may happen on the PBX side. And uh, we are not pretending to do a SVC training or PBX training on this session. But uh, it's going to be uh, um, enough uh, explain for you to follow the steps and make it work. We have other webinars and other uh, training uh, resources that you can use to uh, learn more about SBCs and, and free PBX, etc. So let's go to the PBX configuration. In this case, I'm using PBX Act, but uh, it's exactly the same for free PBX. And, uh, most of the functionalities that we are going to use are automatically always enabled on, on free PBX because we are using this for for uh, Sangoma phones. So Sangoma phones, um, phone apps, and endpoint manager are capabilities that you have for free in free PBX. So the scope of the steps that we are going to show is uh, uh, one is make sure that we are running on the latest versions. Uh, some comments about the IP addresses and ports, uh, some adjustments that we need to do on the intrusion, intrusion detection of the PB, uh, PBX, some parameters that we may need to change or, or uh, configure on the asterisk zip configuration, some extensions configuration, and what we need to do on the endpoint provisioning, endpoint manager, to make sure that the phones can, will be able to auto provision without any issue. Okay, for PBX Act, I'm, I'm running on the latest version today is 10.13.66-17. Uh, so make sure that you have the latest version before you start doing the configuration. The, the way to do that in, in PBX Act is going to the system admin mod module section and click on the update option. You wanna see which one is the, the version you have. And if there is not the latest one, you're going to have a message saying this is not the latest one, and you can click a button to update it uh, immediately. Uh, if you are 
running on free PBX is just going to the module administration section and just run the online update. Okay, uh, we are going to have only one it, 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 internet interface or network interface on the on the PBX. In this case, it's uh, going to be my Ethernet Zero interface. Um, I have a TCP. It could be static. In, in this case, it's just uh, the 10.0.0.49, which is going to be the local IP address on the LAN uh, network uh, where the where the PBX is, is stored. Um, I have a uh, default gateway here, but you, if the SVC is going to take care of everything, uh, you don't really need even a, a default gateway. In, re in, in regards to the report management, there is an, uh, an in system admin, there is a section to um, administer or manage the different ports. The ports that are usually needed are the admin port, which is basically the HTTP access to the to the PBX. <clears throat> By default, in free PBX is the port 80, the traditional HTTP port. On PBX, that, the default is the 2001. Okay, you can change it here if you want. I don't really, unless you have a real reason, don't, don't really recommend to change it. There are four additional ports needed, the 81 to the 84, or even the 80, 85 that are used for UCP, which is the user control panel, for provisioning, for the RESTful APIs uh, used by the phone apps and, the, and for the phone apps. Uh, you don't need to change these uh, ports, but if you change the ports here, we have to take into account those changes for port forwarding that we're going to do on the, maybe on, on, on the next slides. Okay, <clears throat> another important section on the system admin is going to the intrusion detection. The intrusion detection, by default, is enabled to only uh, have on the white list the local loop address. So you have to add here your local LAN network in order to avoid to block the whole connection with the SBC in case of something is a um, uh, wrongly interpreted as a registration failure, okay? So you have here the different parameters of how many failures, in how much time, and uh, just add here the, the network. You can just even add just the IP address of the SPC. Okay, then we, we're going to go to one of the options, which is called the asterisk zip settings. If I have a moment here, let me show you. Okay, on the PBX admin, you have a section here on the settings that is called uh, asterisk zip settings. Same thing on free PBX. If we go to after SIP settings, there is two tags, general SIP settings and channel SIP settings. On the general SIP settings, the only thing we need to make sure is that the, the section of NAT settings that is, uh, that, um, is known as the external address. <coughs> we, <coughs> I'm sorry. We have here the external IP address of the SVC. Remember on the graph? On the diagram, this is the external IP address that will be known by the remote uh, uh, endpoints as the access IP address for the PBX. In reality, this is not the IP address, the public IP address for the PBX, but for the SPC. So we need to inform to the asterisk settings that this is the IP address that will be published as the external IP address. Don't use the detect network settings because it's going to take uh, whatever he detects as the remote IP address. And also we're going to need to disable nothing because we are not going to do any nothing 
uh, we are not going to do any uh, natrosversal, far end natrosversal detection. The, the, the phones will be detected as local phones. Any, any remote extension will, will not look like a remote extension for the PBX because the PBX is behind the SBC. And the SBC is doing a back-to-back -back connection between the real extension and the PBX. So the PBS will believe that the phone is in reality on the local IP address of the SBC. So we're going to disable nothing. We're going to enable here IP configuration as public IP and make sure that the TLS is disabled because we are not using TLS on the PBX. TLS is going to be managed by the SBC. Okay. Also, if you want, this is not, not necessary, but, but if you want, even you can enforce the fact that there is no nothing associated to any extension. You can go to any extension configuration. In this case, we are on the configuration for extension 3001. And on the advanced settings, we are disabling NAT. Okay. That's all what that has to do with the SIP configuration side. Now, I want any remote phones to be able to provision using the endpoint manager, okay? And in order to do that, we are going to need to make a, a few adjustments on the default values that came with the endpoint manager. One of them is, again, the external address will be the SBC external IP address, okay? So we need to change here on external address for the endpoint manager. Let me show you what it is on the real interface. If I go, if I'm navigating in a real PBX, here on the modules, I can go to endpoint manager. And in endpoint manager, there is an option here that is called global settings. This global settings, Okay, here I'm going to write down the, uh, type in the, the public IP address of the ASVC. Okay, that's one of the changes. That's, that's, that's the only way we're going to be able to provision the phones externally. So, in addition to this, uh, let me show you something here. When we are using the endpoint manager, there is a section here associ associated to the brands of the different phones that we are going to use. In this case, we are using Sangoma phones, of course. Um, again, this is this is free on free PBX and PBX app. You always have the ability to do provisioning of Sangoma phones. If I click on Sangoma phones, you're going to see different uh, templates. There is one template that always comes by default called the Sangoma default. In this case, uh, what I recommend on the step-by-step -step instructions that I'm, I'm giving to you on this presentation, instead of doing any changes on the default uh, template, we're going to create a specific template for TLS SRTP. Okay? And the way to do that is you can go to the Sangoma default, and you can use this tag here that is called task and create a duplicate. Then you assign a name, okay, and just submit the query, and you are going to have a copy. I already did that, so I'm not submitting the, the request. Okay, so we already have the copy of the Sangoma default called Sangoma Default TLS SRTP. If I click on that uh, specific template, now I have the different parameters that I can configure, like what, which are the phone models that are associated to this template, uh, regional parameters associated to the, to, to the template, like what is the time zone, etc., etc. You're going to have a bunch of different options associated more, uh, most likely to the to the phone 
like uh, how I want the screen saver to work, how I want I want to enable or not uh, to store the uh, picture of contacts or uh, to show the missed calls, etc. All of these are parameters associated to the phone configuration, and this may vary from brand to brand, may be different from brand to brand. Okay, so the important thing here is on the general side, because I'm going to use this template for remote phones, I am going to enable default external template here. This is going to be the default external template. It's not going to be the default internal template. That means that anytime an external phone tries to provision, okay, the template that is going to be associated is this one. Okay. Also on the SIP destination address, instead of using internal or external, again I'm going to use custom. And here we need to put the registration domain. This is how the provisioning system is going to be able to tell the phone which is the registration domain in order for that to for any request uh, registra registrar request sent to the SPC came come with the domain and the SPC is going to identify that domain we're going to see how later and the provisioning address again is going to be custom also here we are going to put the external SPC uh, public IP, and also you can see that I am adding the the port. It's a 54.85.2.86 port 83. This is the provisioning port. Okay. In addition to this, because the SBC, because the phones are going to need to send the domain and at the same time send all the traffic to the, the SVC, I am going to enable uh, in this section called redundancy, the outbound proxy. And the outbound proxy is going to be pointing to the SVC external address. And the outbound proxy port is going to be the port that we are going to enable on the SVC for TLS. OK? So this is exactly what the, the coming couple of slides are going to tell you. Okay, first we created the new template called Sangoma default uh, uh, TLS SRTP. Okay, and I I didn't show you why I create that that template. Let me go back one step. Okay, the the other thing that I change here is on the models. Let me take, for example, the S500. No, in the models one here. Here you are going to define the specific functionalities for each one of the of the keys of the phone. But when we go to the main menu again to the endpoint, here's an option that is called the base file edit, and the base file edit is a tool that allows you to go in detail and modify any uh, phone related parameter that is not necessarily exposed on the GUI interface for the endpoint manager. For example, uh, the phones are going to be provisioned with TLS, but the extensions from the perspective of the PBX doesn't know that TLS is being used. Okay, the way the way the phone is provisioned traditionally when TLS is used from the PBX is that you define TLS as part of the extension profile. But now it's not the case. The phones are going to use UDP. Uh, the extensions are going to be configured UDP on the PBX side, or TLS is going to be uh, used on the phone. So I can go and edit the specific base profile, base file of any brand, any phone brand. Okay, you're going to see there is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of variables that we can manage. Okay, you not necessarily need to change anything here, except for a few exceptions, like this one. We are going to use two of the variables, three variables of the, the phone. One is called the P130 uh, that defines the transport. Okay, and we are using the option two. 
we are setting up P130, which is the value two, okay? The value two for P130. That means that that we are going to enforce. Let me go back. Okay. That means that we are going to enforce TLS as the protocol for for this template. We are also enforcing with value two for 183, which means that we are enforcing SRTP. And also, we are enforcing RTP port, uh, which is needed for NAT transversal. Okay. So we just save, and that's it. Okay, that's what we already did. We changed three parameters on the base file for the new recently created uh, uh, template. We already did this. We changed the provisioning server to the uh, external IP address of the SVC with the port. We already assigned the outbound proxy and the outbound proxy port. Okay, and that's it. Nothing else is needed on the PBX side. Now, we are going to set up the SVC side. Okay. Maybe one question, um, mm -hmm. Ernesto? Yes. Yeah, so in the example we're using here with the SBC, right, we use the SBC to encrypt communications that are on the outside, in the open, on the internet. Yes. And then it transcodes back or, or de descramble, de decrypt messages mm -hmm. to use normal, you know, on the clear, I guess, if you're on the inside of the network. But if somebody wanted to go use an SBC and use TLS and SRTP all the way to the PBX, would that be possible? Yes. Yes, of course. Uh, is is a if we want to do that, what we need to yeah. do is basically uh, we don't need to uh, enforce a TLS because that is going to be provisioned automatically. Just assigning TLS has the transport protocol on the PBX configuration. In other in other words, if we go to the PBX configuration and go to extensions. Okay, let's say any extension, extension three uh, three thousand and one. Uh, I think it's here in advanced. Okay, you see here is a parameter called transport. Okay, by default it's set up with UDP, and that's why we need to enforce TLS on the template because otherwise the phone is going to be provisioned with UDP. If I put TLS here, I'm enforcing TLS from the PBX uh, um, to the phone or to the SVC, in which case I'm going to need to enable TLS also on the internal profile of the SVC. So the SVC is going to be talking TLS both ways, up to the real uh, extension and back to the PBX. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That, that that could be somebody can can say okay then what, why I need the SBC? Well, that that's true. You can do TLS directly to the to the phone, but also there are other things that the SBC is doing, like resolving the net transversal issues. Okay, so you don't need a stone server. You don't need uh, to use a uh, ice. You don't need uh, there is a uh, also transcoding. Maybe you need to you want to keep your local. You don't want. I mean, one of the uh, one of the purposes of, of separating this type of things from the PBX is to keep the resources on the PBX for the PBX functionalities per se, for the telephony functionalities facing the user, right? But but it's a valid solution also, and that's why we are doing a seminar of three different ways on doing it. SVC is one option. Everyone, every one of the options has pros and cons. Okay. Okay, on the SBC, we're gonna, the scope is gonna be uh, configuring zip profiles, a zip profile, uh, media profiles, TLS and SSL certificates uh, where needs to be loaded, uh, domain and upper registration, 
and core routing. Those are the five different topics that we need to touch. Uh, a zip profile, the SVC, the way you see an SVC, as, a, as a Freddie said at the beginning, we have two physical interfaces, okay? One facing the internal LAN and one facing the one side, okay? Each one of them has a what we call a zip profile associated. It's, it's, a, it's a bunch of, of uh, configuration parameters associated to a specific profile that is listening or generating zip traffic on that point, on that specific interface. So we're gonna have two zip profiles here, one zip profile looking to the outside and one zip profile looking to the inside. Yeah. Um, one, of the one of the first steps we need to define is uh, which media codecs are going, are going to be used by, by the SBC. And then, because we have two different profiles, we may want to use the SVC to transcode, okay? In which case, we need to define which codecs are going to be used on the internal side and which codecs are going to be used on the external side, okay? So we're gonna create an internal media profile and an external media profile. I'm not using G729 in this case because I'm using a VM version for the lab, but you can use G729 also for the external side. Typically, if you have a lot of users using, for, for example, soft phones, you're going to try to use a G729 or GSM or ILBC uh, uh, codec because they take less bandwidth, right? But you don't want to use those codecs inside your network, so you're going to let the SPC do the transcoding. The other thing is uh, I'm not going to explain the details of TLS certificates. There is a there is an example of how to create and manage certificates on the SVC in our wiki. I'm putting the link there. But uh, the, the, the real need here is we're gonna need to load two certificates. One, what we call the CA certificate, is the certificate that identifies the certification authority, and uh, a server certificate, that is a certificate that is gonna uh, establish an interchange with the remote phones uh, to do the uh, setup of the SSL channel. And then we go to the SIP profiles. Remember that I mentioned we have two SIP profiles, one external and one internal, and we're gonna call the external external extensions and the internal internal extensions. And the external extensions is gonna be configured to talk only to TLS as I'm showing here, okay? And the internal is gonna be talking only UDP, okay? Uh, I'll show you more in detail. If I go to the SVC here. This is the GUI interface for the SVC. Here are my, my, two, my two profiles. The external extensions, let me, a little bit bigger. External extension profiles and internal extension profile. And one has the 10.0.0.120 and the other one is in the other interface. You see one is on the Ethernet 0 and the other one is on the Ethernet 1. Okay. If I look into the external extensions, is the one facing the internet. Okay. I have several sections here. Uh, one section is what we call the domain section where we already associated a domain. And this is the same domain that the phones are gonna be sending for authentication purposes, right? And we already did the configuration on the provision inside to allocate that domain to the phones. So if I edit the configuration for the zip profile, on this section here, I'm, I'm associating the external IP address that will be announced through the external side for the SIP communications and the RTP communications, okay? Also, I already associated here the media profiles, in other words, the codecs that are going to be used on this profile. I'm using the external media profile, okay? 
and if I go to the internal, oh, let me let me show something. And also on the same external profile, there is a section called encryption here, where I have TLS version one selected. I already selected which certificate are going to is going to be used, okay? And for the testing purposes, I'm disabling disabling the date verification and certificate verification of the certificate that is going to be sent by the phone to the SVC. And here is where I'm associating the TLS port that is going to be used on the SVC. Okay? If I go to the internal profile, the internal profile doesn't need to have any public IP address published because this internal profile is looking just to the inside is using the internal media profiles and on the encryption section there is no certificate associated okay and there is a, a rtp is disabled sr secure rtp is disabled so it's going to be talking pure udp the protocol is selected here you see it's gray out because the SBC is up and running in order to change the transport we need to shut down the profile but here you can select the, the transport protocol. In this case, it's UDP, and the other case was TNS. Here, here, and here. You see, it's TNS here. Okay, so, then we have set up the internal and external C profiles. We associated the TLS, the media profiles, etc. We already showed this. Okay, and now we are going to create the domain. In order to create the domain, we need to associate uh, a way or a trunk to connect the SVC with the PBX. To do that, we create a zip trunk. And the zip trunk is pointing to the IP address of the PBX. And that's basically it. It's just create a zip, uh, zip trunk associated to the internal profile and point to the IP address of the PBX. And this is going to be used when you create a domain to create a domain called PBX at Sagoma Miami .com, uh, uh, enabling the forward registration, then using the internal extensions profile and using the zip trunk that we recently created to send the registration request to the PBX. And finally, we need on the, uh, this creates the domain, and finally we need to go, once we create the domain, if I show you the domains here, it's already created. Okay. Is already created here. You can see it's enabled, it's using the internal extension profile and it's pointing to the PBS via the zip trunk. And then on the external zip profile, we bound, we already bound that uh, uh, domain specifically to this C profile. So now the C profile is able to receive registration requests for that domain. And he knows how to do the authentication because he's going to forward that registration directly to the PBX. Okay. So the last thing we need to do is to create a couple of dial plans. The, the way the SVC manages the calls, any 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 SIP invites, is a SIP invite always arrives to the SVC via one of the uh, SIP profiles. If a, if an invite is arriving to the external profile, it's an invite that is being generated, let's say, by one of the endpoints by the remote extensions, right? And if a call is received on the internal profile, is because it's a call that is coming from the PBX. 
So on each profile, we can associate a buyer plan. And the way to associate, if I am, if I am on the SIP profiles menu, and I go, for example, to the external profile, I'm going to find a section here that is called a session routing. And it's pointing to a routing plan called re from remote extensions. Okay, This is the external profile receiving calls from remote extensions. And this uh, dial plan was created using on the section of routing here for the SBC, we create a dial plan call from remote extensions. If I see what this remote extension does, okay, it has a rule. I'm not going to explain the details, but it has a rule that says that if on the invite or the request information or the standard information is coming a destination address that match this pattern here, just route the call to a trunk call domain pbexact and send the number. Okay, it's a it's a very easy uh, interface to create dial plans. So we're going to have a dial plan for the inbound, for the calls coming from remotes and calls going uh, to remotes coming from the PBX. And each one of these dial plans will be associated to the internal profile or the external profile. Okay, so here are the two dial plans. I always, uh, okay, we, we associated the routing plan on the zip profile. Um, I always recommend to enable full identification here. This is going to um, affect the header on how the URI is a, uh, is, um, is write it down into the header. Okay, and now we're gonna define what else needs to be done on the SVC. We are assuming right now that we are not doing port forwarding on the corporate firewall. So any port forwarding, forwarding needed will be managed by the SVC because everything is sent to the SVC, including the provision requirements. So. Uh, I'm assuming that the PBX is a, uh, pardon, uh, the, the SBC HTTP access is in the port 8080. Okay, this is a configuration inside the SBC. I'm using a 4443 for the HTTPS to the SBC. And you can see, for example, you can see here, I am accessing the GUI for the SBC on the same domain, port 8080. But for the PBX, I use it the same domain for 2001. Okay, and that is happening because the port forwarding. I'm going to show you how. Okay, on the section uh, file IP firewall, if you see on the SBC here, there is a section here called IP firewall. And the IP firewall, I'm forwarding several ports. I'm going to explain with, uh, which which one of what those ports mean. Okay, those are the ports that I'm forwarding from, uh, forwarding to the IP address of the PBX. Okay, uh, I'm forwarding port 443, or uh, and 2001. Those are the two HTTP or HTTPS access to the PBX. I'm forwarding them, and I may be forwarding them. If I'm forwarding them, I am opening those ports to the external. But I, I, I can, I, I'll show you how to, in the port opening section, you can limit uh, which source IP addresses can land on this port. Also, the other ports that are needed to be forwarded is port 81 to 85, provisioning on phone apps, port 69 and 21 for TFTP and FTP. Uh, those ports, 8001 uh, to 8003 for Zulu and UCP. 
and etc. So all of them are explained there. And 8088 and 8089 for WebRTC registration. Okay. Those are the ports that are needed to be forwarded. Also, you can open the ports. Any port that is needed because the configuration was the SVC will be automatically open uh, by the same uh, configuration process. When you create a new zip profile, any port where this, is pro this zip profile is listening will be automatically open. The only additional thing you can do is if I have a port open like the Let's say 8080. I can add a whitelist. In this case, port 8080 has a whitelist. And the whitelist is pointing only to my public IP address in my lab. So only from here I can access 8080 to get into the GUI interface for the SVC. This is a typical configuration of a, a firewall. So those functionalities are here. And again, you can do this also on the, instead of doing it on the SVC, you can do it on the, on the corporate uh, firewall. Okay. Now everything should work. Uh, the, the quick demo that I'm going to show is uh, the following. Uh, where is it here? Okay, I have a phone on my desk right now. This is the extension 3002. Okay, this is a real extension. Here's my hand over here. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to show you going to the endpoint manager. What I'm going to do is uh, to provision this phone from scratch. So extension mapping in inside endpoint manager is, what is the option that is going to show me which phones are currently provisioned and where they are, okay? A phone, when you open the phone out of the box coming from the factory or after a factory reset, okay, they they come with a no configuration at all, okay? And when you put up the phone, the first thing the phone does is it tries to get an IP address, okay? It looks for a DSCP server. If the DSCP server provides a, a option 66 with a provisioning server, that would be enough for the phone to look for the provisioning server. But if the case is that you don't have the provisioning server set up via option 66, the phone will uh, access what we call the redirection server from Sagoma. That's a public server on the on the internet. And it will look for the what is the provisioning address assigned and you you have access to to the Sagoma portal, okay? to associate um, to any phone. For example, this phone is the 0097, and it has already associated this provisioning server, okay? So if I don't have option 66, anyway, the phone will look into the redirection server on the internet and will get this address for provisioning. Okay, here we have which phones are provision, including the 3002. I'm going to take the 3002 and I'm going just to delete this entry on the endpoint manager. So you can see here also that all the phones are registered from the same IP address. And guess what? This IP address is which one? This is the internal IP address of the SPC. So the PBX Things that all the phones are located on the SVC IP address. And is the SVC the one that is really uh, looking into the where the phone really is? And 
if I go to the SVC and show you a profile, if I see the external profile here, you will see all the forms that are registered on the PBX via the SVC. And here you can see the real IP address where the phone is located on which port. Okay, and if I go to any of these phone uh, extensions, I can see more details. They are using TLS, TLS, this is the expiration time, etc. So, I already deleted here the extension 3002, and what I'm going to do now is uh, I am going to reboot and factory reset this phone. This is the extension 3009, 3002. I'm going to factory reset. You're going to see in a moment that the phone is rebooting. Okay, uh, while the phone is rebooting, is there any question that you, uh, Freddy, may want for me to address? Freddy, are you still there? Okay, let me see the questions here. What about mobile uh, phones using SIP client? Uh, what about push notification on that for the US? Okay, regarding push notification, I have to double check, but uh, regarding any any IP I, uh, soft soft clients like uh, Bria or uh, Soiper, etc., you can uh, you just you just need to enable TLS SRTP on the phone. Okay. Uh, you are not going to provision via the endpoint manager, but I can tell you exactly what needs to be configured on the on the soft phone. Uh, how are the provision requests secure over the internet? If you are okay, uh, you know the, the endpoint manager. The only way to provision a phone is by the, there is an, an HTTPS session established using an internal certificate on the phone that came from factory and that is a, a exclusive of Sagoma phones. There is an authentication process initially. If that authentication doesn't go through, the phone is never provisioned, not even independent of, of which protocol are you using, if the TFTP or or whatever you use. Or FTP or HTTPS. I think we lost Frederick. Okay, uh, I know there are some other questions coming in. Um, I'll try to address those uh, at the end. So once once the phone is reboot and has been configured for factory factory values, so because there is no configuration associated yet on the on the provisioning system, the only thing that it uh, does is a loads those are basic configuration with two options, login internal and login external. And because this is an external phone, I'm going to use the external option to provision my extension 3002. And I'm going to type in the password that I use for the voicemail of that extension. It's not the zip password. So once that has been, okay, let me change something here. I'm going to refresh now. (laughs) 
I'm refreshing the extension mapping. Somehow number extension number didn't came through, but uh, it will come now. Okay, let me see other questions here. Okay, here's the phone, the 3001. Let me just refresh the configuration. It's a question, what about mobile phones? I already got that one. How are they provisioning requests secure over the internet? Okay, I'll send uh, for, for the benefit of all the attendees, there is a question how the, how the secure provisioning is set up on the internet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna add to the responses uh, to, to all the attendees a, a link to a document that explains how it works to know if I can change one port. Yes. Uh, I want to know if I can change one port. I guess uh, talking to, you're talking about any of the provisioning ports or things like that. I said, yes, you can always change them. Uh, so it's best to have, let me just see how false the separate mess. So. Well, uh, the question here is, uh, so it is best to have the UC and the phones in a separate subnet, so the SBC, Ethernet set of facing the LAN, and the Ethernet will face in the subnet for UC and the phones. Uh, well, not, not necessarily. Remember that the, the only reason we are using the SBC in this case is not for phones that are local, it's for phones that are remote. Can I change any port on the SBC? For example, can I have one device with 2,000 ports on my LAN? Can I use another? Uh, yes. I have three PBS sixty set up behind a Sony World Router with only ports open up to C providers address only, no others. The SIM is not and does not have the public IP. Is this okay set up? No external for for now. Yes, that's an, that's a correct setup. Uh, I, I in the in this case, in this example I'm I'm not talking about any or how to face the connectivity to SIP providers, okay? SIP providers can land directly, has a SIP trunk directly to the PBX, of course, and uh, but also they can they can be managed the, via the SBC, okay? So again, uh, you can have the SBC facing the access side and the peering side. From where does the phone know Uh, from where the phone knows the PBX, uh, the domain? Uh, that's a good question. On the endpoint manager, uh, on the configuration for the for the profile, uh, we assign that domain. Uh, there is a, a slide where we show that. Okay, so before before doing that, I want to show just the phone. And the phone was uh, correctly provisioned, okay, uh, and everything is up and running. So I can just dial to that extension, okay. I can pick up the call, okay. And now you are going to see on the right upper corner of the screen this little uh, icon showing a little lock, which means that this call is a, is a secure call. 
is using SRTP and TLS, okay? So, and I can see that all my uh, functionalities on the phone apps, for example, this phone app shows which queues am I associated. It shows the red button, meaning that I'm logging in some of the queues. I can just log out the queues. The red button goes out. So everything is working. Phone apps are working. Okay. My follow follow me is enabled. I can just disable. The, the uh, red light goes off. I can just enable again. The red light goes on. So everything is up and running. So I think we are about 13 minutes past the hour. Uh, so I guess I guess we I guess we lost uh, Frederick. Uh, but in, in any case, uh, I think we we passed the hour. So we have a few questions, not too many, that hasn't been have been able haven't been able to respond. So I'm going to put together all the questions and share with everyone with all the answers. Uh, before we finish, I just want to tell you a couple additional things. <clears throat> okay, so what we did is, first of all, we understood the same scenario. We did this uh, PBA setup, and we did some of the specific actions like uh, remote extensions, uh, non-NAT or transcoding protocol conversion needed, even provisioning will flow through the SVC. Then we did the SVC configuration, and then we tested live. Some additional values is a single point of entrance for everything. So we don't we we from from the external point of view, there is only one domain associated to everything: provisioning and uh, and SIP. PBS is not SIP exposed, and you can expand this to additional PBS behind the same SVC if you want. I can explain you if you have any interest on how to do it. Don't forget about the next session on January 10. We're gonna address how to do VPNs how to solve the same type of problems with VPNs using the VPN internal built-in server on the uh, free PBX or PBX Act. And on January 24, we're going to have the TLS SRTP implementation using the built-in capabilities in, in free PBX and SVC. Also, uh, if you attend the three sessions, there's, you're going to get a certificate uh, as a thank you for attending, uh, as a confirmation that you had enough patience to tolerate me for more than an hour on each one of them, and uh, maybe some additional surprises at the end. And uh, last but not least, uh, once I close this session today, you're going to get an immediate set of five questions. And we really appreciate your opinion and uh, your contribution responding to those questions. So. Uh, Having said that, uh, I'm thanking you for attending this session today, uh, expecting to see you on the next one. So have a good day.